welcome back, everyone, to day two of Leading from Beside. Um, this is our day to talk, 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 and think, think, think about dance with dancers and dance artists. Um, this esteemed panel, when we talked about how we would introduce people, we realized that uh, if we actually unpacked the bio of everyone at this table, that would run out the entire time for the panel discussion. Let's do that. So I have <laughs> printed up bios for all of the speakers. If you didn't grab one at the front door, they're available and you can read about their amazing trajectories as artists and the multiple awards they have won and the groundbreaking, world-changing uh, performances and creations that they have made over the years. So my introductions are going to be terse. Um, <laughs> Like yesterday, um, everyone gets to speak for eight minutes. At seven minutes, uh, is that right? A light will flash at seven minutes, so you know you've got a minute left? And the music will start very quietly. And then at eight minutes, the music will get louder. And of course, the reason that we're doing this is because we want to make time to, to hear from you and to have a, a rich discussion as part of our, our time together this morning. So I am going to introduce the speakers one at a time as they speak. And um, speakers, we are going to have to do a little bit of a chair jig. Uh, so after each speaker, um, the person in front of the laptop is going to get up and move. And the next person is going to come to the come to the laptop so that they can work their own visuals while they speak. So to begin, I would like to introduce Karen Jameson, who we are so lucky to have here with us. Many I know of the dancers in this room have mentored with Karen in community-engaged work. She has been acknowledged nationally for her groundbreaking work in community engagement and cross-cultural dance in Vancouver and in coastal First Nations communities for over 25 years. Karen? <laughs> Thank you, Marie. So I'm going to try to manipulate this thing and my notes and timers, and I'm also going to try to talk. So we'll see what happens. So it's going to be great. Yeah, no pressure, Marie. <laughs> and Margaret's going to help me. <laughs> Okay, oops, not quite. Now this is peculiar in that it started somewhat into it. So I'm just gonna back up. Um, uh, Karen, we're not seeing anything on the big screen yet, so maybe oh. uh, hold for a second. There it is. Okay, you're okay. good to go. Am I on? You're, you're on. on. So I've been asked to focus on my tenure work at Carnegie Community Center. And through that lens, address models of practice, inclusivity, what constitutes success, and this idea of leading from beside. So Carnegie has been, for me, and I think for many, a doorway into new ways of understanding dance, for me, new ways of understanding community. I've been led along the path towards Carnegie through these compelling questions that have been driving me since I began dancing. For 20 years, I danced within the professional milieu and uh, was completely immersed and enamored of that practice that I experienced there. Those questions, however, drove me beyond the confines of professional stage-based dance. And one of the most important questions was dance as an embodiment of the spirit of place, and this drew me into collaborative dialogue with First Nations artists and thinkers. And for many years, I worked with Chief Hagbogwat, 
Ken Harris, Margaret Grenier's father, in a position of tutelage and learning, and in pursuit of this power of dance to embody spirit of place, led me to, to do many pieces that uh, engaged um, dancers, professional dancers, community dancers, and uh, audience to follow the path of a buried stream, to occupy places like the roundhouse, almost like an archeological dig through our bodies to find what is the spirit here, its history, its present uh, life. But I was drawn to Carnegie perhaps by the possibility of dance having the power to heal. And this healing power is one that's run like a theme throughout the work with Carnegie. I'm also continued and running like a theme to pursue spirit of place. And this sense of, of place uh, was where we began at Carnegie. We began with a piece called Stand Your Ground. And I'm just going to read just a line from Sandy Cameron, a poet from the downtown east side who's no longer with us. And he spoke about the piece, said a large iron gate behind us swung open and the dancers came forward silent and mysterious like spirits from the underworld in dream time, dressed in multicultural costumes of dream time. We wore masks on the back of our head and we used the gate of the fire hall as a symbol that we could uh, access to, to communicate something of the experience of many people in the downtown east side, east side, downtown east side, in their relationship to the Fire Hall Arts Center. And the, the piece Stand Your Ground honored many places along the way to Carnegie. It was the path the connection between Carnegie and the fire hall that that piece addressed. We've moved the Carnegie dance troupe, if I were to describe it, is an imaginary entity, very permeable in its, its boundaries, transient, uh, transitory, and yet enduring. Uh, there is a core group of people who have returned and returned from the beginning uh, over 10 years. There are people that come and go. We are constantly uh, uh, welcoming new people as we consolidate uh, the practice of those who have stayed. The underlying principle of the Carnegie Dance Troupe is absolute inclusivity. And at the heart of what we do is practice. Uh, the practice draws our attention to breath, to the weight of the body, to the rebound energy of the earth, and to the feeling and sense of the dance moving through us. So this is the practice. And what I found over the years is that by sharing this practice, by practicing together, it opens a doorway to, to a state of mind of integration of body, mind, spirit whereby we can communicate to each other, explore, create, uh, and embody the emerging dance that's coming out of our work together. So it's a creative process that, that uh, has at its heart practice, and through that practice, uh, a communication on a deeper level, which I call dance, a state of mind, a state of being, a state of the state of dance. Um, I've been asked to talk of models of practice, and since I don't really know what model of practice I follow, I looked up model of practice and tried to figure out what it was, and apparently it's the, the model connects the practice with the theory. And I have never been much of a theorist in the 25 years I've been working in this field, and I have seen myself more as a field worker, kind of collecting data, uh, experimentation, exploration, uh, through the practice of what I do. And this practice is uh, discipline-based, it's dance-centric, it's investigative. Uh, when I say that the principle underlying the Carnegie Dance Troupe is absolute inclusivity, this, of course, 
raises all kinds of questions, such as, uh, am I excluding those who don't like what I do? So if somebody comes in, and there's always um, many, many desires in any group of a kind of dance, if uh, this person wants to do hip hop and I don't offer hip hop, is that exclusion? So those questions always, um, I love them. It's it, absolute inclusivity is, has got uh, lots of problems and, it's, uh, and yet it's a working principle that has, has, served, has served us well. So joy perhaps is one of the uh, central central creations of this, this kind of work. And I would say that I measure success by the degree to which we are all dancing together, communicating through our bodies, creating together that state of transformation that is achieved through practice that joy of dance that comes from that integration of the body, the mind, the spirit. That to me is success. <laughs> I'll just back out of here. Okay. While you're backing out of there, I would like next to introduce Marion Esquinton. Her professional dance path began in Mexico and moved on to Paris and Edmonton, and now we're lucky to have her here in Vancouver. She and her partner, Christina Lemieux, founded Polymer Dance in Vancouver in 2012. <coughs> Maybe I'll move this closer because I don't speak that loud. Okay, Cherry, here we go. So, uh, yeah, I'm Miriam Mesquitin, and Christina Lemieux and I lead Polymer Dance. I will get to talk to you a bit today about uh, our history, our philosophy of community aspects, and the uh, who's and the how's we get to answer to a more inclusive and democratic definition of the dance and the dancer. So Christine and I met in Edmonton, where we were both part of the orchestra's dance group, which was hosted by the University of Alberta. I was a teacher, dancer, choreographer, mentor, board member. Christina was a board member, dancer, and show coordinator. Uh, we had over 300 people in the year taking year-round classes at the beginner, intermediate, and advanced level of jazz and modern dance. Uh, we also had a yearly show that uh, hosted over 100 performers with choreography from the students, the faculty, and guest choreographers. I believe this year's guest choreographer is Justine Chambers. So last year I attended the 50th anniversary of the group which celebrated the thousands of dancers that have been touched by the group. We also had the opportunity to work with Kathy Ochoa, a very creative and innovative choreographer, and that's where we started to work with improvisation ensemble, practicing Qigong, a contemporary dance and physicality, we were to develop an understanding and awareness of the energy of the individual and the group and what the space needed. And through that, we develop a system of tools that we keep using and uh, keep expanding through our practice. So when we moved here, and we decided to create something that took the best elements of these two groups, so we created Polymer Dance in 2012 for people over the age of 16 that provides progressive training, technique training at the beginner and intermediate level, performance opportunities, and carrying out as an improvisation ensemble. So who gets to be in uh, Polymer? We currently have 18 members, 67 since the beginning. We have had two men. The ages range from 20 to 59. 50% of our participants return for more than one session, and 20% of our participants return every session after they register for the first time. Each class has 75 minutes of technique training and 45 minutes of improvisation. The beginner class is held at Hillcrest Community Center as a class on a shared revenue model. I teach that class, and we believe we are the only such offer in the city. We have a little problem because that class is full, so I cannot recruit any more people to that class. 
The intermediate and advanced uh, level is hosted as a residency program at the Moberly Arts and Cultural Center, we, where we get also support in terms of marketing, performance opportunities, and belonging to this network of facilitators. The classes are taught by the same teachers that are teaching the professional level classes, so we host teachers for three or four weeks at a time. Uh, who gets to be there is moms, teachers, students, professionals, um, Eastern Europeans, Canadians, Latinos, of course. Uh, at the beginner level is people who have never danced and are now fulfilling this dream of starting to dance. So that's a success. At the intermediate level, we have people that have trained somewhat and want to continue dancing. So I'll talk about a bit of our community aspects and our philosophies. The first one is that dance is for everybody. So we believe, and this is an answer or part of the philosophy that we answer collectively. So we believe that anybody can articulate emotions or speech through body movement. And for that, so we provide training to develop the flexibility, the alignment, uh, awareness, so we can be dancers not only today, but for a long time. And to expand our self-awareness and our repertoire and uh, challenge our habitual patterns. The next concept is that dance is for everywhere. Not everyone has time, desire, or means to attend a dance show. And if there is no audience, there is no performance, there is no dance. So we challenge the definition of the stage, and more often we take our performances to parks, parades, and festivals. With that, not only we reach new audiences, passers-by that are pleasantly surprised, it has political meaning, because at that moment, the community owns the space and claims it as its own, generating a shared sense of pride joy, identity, and safety, which is a privilege, some of us that we have not experienced that in other places. The third community aspect is in the improvisation ensemble. With improvisation, we allow a wider access to the art form. We leave behind ideal shapes and types. We leave behind the authority of a single choreographer, and we also leave behind the subjectivity of individual desires. We use scores with kinesthetic and spatial elements. This creation is intersubjective and instantaneous. The dancer is a communal one. And that responds a little bit to the question that we had at the uh, keynote speaking. How do you, you know, measure the individual impact and the communal impact? Well, there is no individual change if there is no community there to be a dancer with it. The dancer is a communal dancer. But at the same time, we also think that it has to bear symbolic and aesthetic value to be presented, not because we all like it, that's enough to present it. So we craft, we curate, we practice, and we listen. We learn to listen to each other and what the space needs. So in terms of success, what would success mean for Polymer is that anybody can perform for any length, any time, anywhere. And that is a challenge because people come and go, yes, so we have to rebuild our listening skills and um, attention to the space, but it is also a greatness, and that's how we fulfill being a polymer, because each monomer or person brings different qualities to the polymer. So who is left out? And some of them by definition, some by choice. So people under the age of 16, people over 55, men, unfortunately, uh, those that don't necessarily want technique training, uh, those that want to pursue choreography, those that are doing a professional dance career, those that cannot or don't want to register into a program, people with mental or physical challenges, or people that think that Moberly is too far. Um, as of measures of success, we do an evaluation every year. I come from a background, I'm a social anthropologist and work with results-based management framework. So we do an evaluation every year and we ask our uh, participants whether they felt that their technique improved, their improvisation improved, and most or all of them respond that they see improvement throughout the year. But it's also very important for us that 100% of them say that they enjoy the group. And I'm just gonna read a couple of quotes. We have tons of this that people offer to us in every evaluation. I enjoy the community, personal growth, performances, feeling like I'm more and more of a dancer, seeing how I move translating to other applications and being part of a company. It makes my soul sing and shine and sparkle. 
So I just want to finish uh, by thanking the Moberly Arts and Cultural Center and the City Parks and Recreation Board for our residency, Hillcrest for hosting our class, the organizers of this amazing event, and of course all the dancers that have trusted Polymer with our journey. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. So now, can I get you to switch spots with Margaret? Oh. Margaret Grenier is of Gitsan and Cree ancestry. She is the executive and artistic direct director of the Dancers of Damahamed, a company that is dedicated to reviving Gitsan dance traditions and presenting Aboriginal dance. Sim Giget, Sigam Hana, Dathwan Sim Sim Giget, Niitun, Gilda Dawit, Sim Wilps Lelt, Toyaxi Hathgedal, Hipt Tune, Musquiam, Squamish, Slaywatooth, Windy and Ochneet Noom, La Kiptit, Lu Am Gaudi, Windy Hoxley, Spagait Disam, Lu Am Gaudi, my heart is happy to be amongst all of you here today, and I acknowledge the unceded traditional territories of the Musquiam, the Slaywatooth and the Squamish upon whose land we all live, play, and create. Um, like Karen, I might get a little bit flustered by <laughs> the slideshow, so I'm going to focus on what I have to say. Um, I'm the artistic director with the Dancers of Dam Lahamid, and I'd like to share a little bit about its history. Also, we produce the Coastal First Nations Dance Festival in partnership with the UBC Museum of Anthropology. And that is something that we have been doing here in Vancouver since 2008. But the history of the work that I do um, in terms of performance goes back to 1952, in which the law, the potlatch ban, had been lifted. Now, I recently learned something new about that. All of my life, I had understood that the law was lifted as some sort of significant change in the way that we understood or respected um, what was taking place here on the Northwest Coast. But I found out that actually the law was just neglected, and as of 1952, we were able to practice once again. But something very significant um, happened at that time, and my grandmother called it awakening, um, as though something had been asleep. And at this time, um, we are three generations of practice. And so what I wanted to speak to in terms of our practice is the importance that it is intergenerational. Um, back in the 1960s, under the guidance of my grandmother, Irene Harris, our family began to practice our songs, our dances, and at that time, it was performance, what, what was what made it different than how it had always been practiced within our feast halls, um, to be shared publicly in that way. But for myself, Growing up, um, dance was vibrantly around me. Dance, song, story. I grew up with the knowledge and understanding of my family as a Dauk, and it was that that um, impacted me so greatly that um, in 2003, um, my husband and I began to take over the work that was becoming too great of a task to carry forward by my parents any longer. <clears throat> to me, community engagement is providing a space for a practice that is multifaceted. 
Um, it's not just about dance, it's about song. Um, we create and hand sew and carve and paint all of our regalia, so it's also um, something that upholds visual arts. It's the training, the knowledge, the oral histories, and also the teachings that sustain us from all of that that is carried forward. It is also being part of a process that fosters healing, um, something that Karen has already spoken to. I was told that um, the whole point of our oral histories is to teach us how to live in a way that honors our origin. And to me, if that is not what is integral to what we are practicing, then I don't really see the point. It is a process that um, what we would categorize as community engagement is a process that is not distinct from the rigor of artistic development, but rather part of a whole. Because to me, what is most important is that, see, I'm not doing a good job with the slides. <laughs> Because to me, what is most important is that it is identity what is being carried forward. For me, it was my identity that was solidified through my practices as a young person. And it's that what is being passed forward from myself to my children, who are now at a place in their lives where they are starting to take on leadership roles of their own. and. Recently, um, I'm now a grandmother, and in, in that, I can see that what started with my grandmother so many years back and all the changes that we have endured over these last several decades is something that is going to move forward in its own way. And whenever it feels that the, the difficulty of what we do and what we are holding for our children um, is too much. We have to remember that we need to hold that so that we don't pass that forward to them as well. So I think that the work that we term as community engagement does have its um, does have its uh, difficulties in that it requires so much of an opening of the heart, so much vulnerability. Uh, this is a place that is probably the most important part of the work that we do. And that's where I'm going to leave things. So I want, I want to compliment you all on how cleverly you, you sat down so that this is just a nimble swip swap every single time. Miriam, if you can change places with Margaret, you're up next. Miriam Colvin is an independent dance artist based in Smithers, BC. She spent six years performing, teaching, and creating dance in Minneapolis, Minnesota before coming to Canada in 2004. And on behalf of the Canadians in the room, Miriam, we are so glad we welcome you. <laughs> Miriam established Miriam, sorry, Miriam established myriad dance projects in Smithers. It's true. That's good to just leave up. Hi. Um, so, <laughs> Could you just warm up your wrists with me, please? Um, I live in Smithers, which, on, oh which God, is on Wet'suwet'en territory. And um, mm -hmm. Smithers is on the Skeena River. And I don't know if you've ever seen a river, or been near a river, <laughs> or touched a river, or lived by a river, or put ashes in a river. But there are boils in my river, and there are rapids, and sometimes leaves float down and hit the water and then get swished around. And sometimes 
When you look under, you can see underwater that there are things popping, little bubbles. They go. And sometimes some bubbles keep going, and other rapids swirl. And sometimes it melts into this silent place where I see things moving, and I feel them in my body, and I breathe. And I remember something. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I think what we just did in many ways sums up my practice. Um, I often offer something that is meaningful to me, and I invite people to step into a place that I recognize is a place where I am comfortable. I am comfortable moving. I'm not so comfortable speaking, so hopefully my words will come today. So thank you for stepping into my circle of comfort. And often in my practice, how I find people to invite is I step into their circles. So here I am in Vancouver in the Roundhouse where I found you. And often what I do is I build on what's already there. So I saw you join Luca, and I noticed that everyone participated in a way that you chose to. And I also noticed that I could see Luca as a partner. And um, although I didn't ask permission to build on what he was doing, um, hey, Luca, was that okay? that I built on what you did. <laughs> and, and I also noticed that um, I'm resting on the words of my colleagues in that there was a foundation of intention and practice spoken by these beautiful artists who spoke before me and um, that we received that together and took from it what we did. So there was a lot that led us into my Skeena River. Um, the photo behind me shows that little star is, is Smithers. It's um, 1,600 kilometers north of here. It's a population of about um, 6,000. And I just wanted to say that I feel really grateful to be invited here today and to be on this territory. Um, my work um, is heavily influenced by where I live. The landscape is dynamic and severe and inspiring and humbling. And um, I just have a few images to offer of projects that I've explored um, and set stages that I've used um, or been welcomed on, um, sometimes a bit more formal. Um, this photo represents a project that I collaborated with our local Julie Labelle. Um, and it was uh, on a theater stage and um, flash mobs or using public spaces um, as Polymer Dance showed us such beautiful photos of and um, also seeing the Carnegie photos. I'm um, honored to be a member of Echoa Hosli, which is a Wet'suwet'en drum and dance group in which I offer my practice and I do not dance. Um, and it is a place of great belonging for me and I've, I'm home and there are some parts of that home that it's important that um, I don't do everything and I still belong fully, which is a really interesting thing, I think, sometimes when we talk about inclusion. Um, and currently I'm working on a project called Into the Current and I'm making a fish bike ballet <laughs> um, and working with masks with uh, three other amazing artists from our province. Um, so having just given a little bit of a sense of where I come from and, and what I'm making, um, I, I'd like to speak a little bit about um, 
the questions that resonated with me that were given to us on this panel. And one of them was, um, what gets overlooked? And I have some questions to pose, <laughs> not answers. Um, in my community, which might be different than your community, sometimes time is overlooked. The amount of time it takes to build relationship and to develop a project um, of meaningful interaction, of creating art together that pushes our forms forward, this takes time. In my community, sometimes what's overlooked is what happens after a project. I think this is an ongoing question. Um, what happens after we've built something together and we've formed communities within communities and then sometimes the artist needs to rest <laughs> or sometimes things change or sometimes just, I mean, life is an ever flowing thing. Um, I'm curious about, in my community, um, sometimes what's overlooked is that we can make amazing art together and that there is a caliber of creation, of performance, of occupying space that is amazing and professional and we can all do it. And sometimes that is doubted. <laughs> um, so those are, yeah, those are the thoughts I'd like to respond to with our panel and with you. And um, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is that I believe um, that we are living culture and we are part of an ever-changing practice. And I'm thrilled to be in that river with all of you. Thank you. Miriam, can you change spots with Naomi? Yes. And Naomi, do we need like a two second tech break? No. No? Okay. No. Naomi Brand is a contemporary dancer, choreographer, teacher, and writer. Originally from Toronto, Naomi danced for 10 years in Calgary before coming to Vancouver in 2013. She is a co-founder of the All Bodies Dance Project. We can do this, right? The one that says play? No. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak this morning. Um, I'm going to talk specifically just about uh, one project that has been occupying quite a bit of my time in the past few years, which is the All Bodies Dance Project. Um, the All Bodies Dance Project is an inclusive project uh, that welcomes dancers with disabilities and non-disabled dancers of a wide range of ages, genders, and backgrounds. Um, I moved to Vancouver in 2013 and, uh, you know, showed up without a job, which is always challenging, and uh, looked around this community and um, noticed that despite uh, Vancouver being one of the most, probably the most physically accessible uh, cities in Canada, there was a real uh, significant gap in, in accessible dance programming. And this was a, a field that I had worked in for, for a number of years in Canada, or in Calgary, previous to here, and uh, was very fortunate to connect with two very dear colleagues, Sarah Lapp and Mireille Rossner. Um, and so we came up with a project. We wrote a Canada Council grant, and we connected with Marie Lopez and the Roundhouse, who have been our champions, and um, we launched this project. Um, for us, the idea of inclusion uh, go hand in hand with the idea of accessibility, which go hand in hand with the idea of just creating a welcoming and warm environment where people feel comfortable uh, and safe. Um, so accessibility in, in our work, uh, well, in, in the world, has, has numerous facets to it. Um, the, the most fundamental thing about accessibility is who can actually get into the room. And I mean this in a very uh, uh, functional way. Um, we 
all, or perhaps many of us, did not notice this morning that you walked into a space, most of you walked into this space, and it didn't have stairs. Um, that is not something to be taken lightly. <laughs> uh, as my colleague Sarah can attest to, there are lots of spaces where dance happens, where art happens, uh, where culture takes place that many people in our community can't access. Um, so the, the physical makeup of a room, of doors, um, of stairs, of, of turning radiuses, of washrooms, uh, is the first thing that determines who gets to be in the practice. Um, so our partnership with the Vancouver Park Board, we, we work in community spaces, is one that is uh, natural and fitting because the Park Board also has an understanding of accessibility um, and around the physical room. Um, there are also other things that the, the Park Board embraces that are in, in line with the work that we do. Um, spaces that have gender neutral washrooms um, spaces that are make an effort to be scent reduced. Uh, these are things that, uh, that allow people to participate in our work um, that may, may not be in other dance spaces. Um, so we look at what are the barriers for people participating. And those could be physical barriers, they're social, they're economic, um, and we try in, in very practical ways to remove those. And these are not things that are a burden to us, they're not accommodation, they're things that are exciting to do. It's not hard to ask people what their preferred pronoun is at the beginning of a session, um, but it is something that might make a huge difference as far as opening up who gets to be involved in art making. Um, economically, dance is a cost of a dance class is prohibitive. Um, we offer our project for free and we are committed to that, um, which means that we need to find funding for it. Um, the location, who, can you get there on public transportation? Can a handy dart get there? Um, the, these are all things that determine who gets to be involved in the practice. Um, and then what actually happens in the room, it, of course, is around who feels safe, who feels welcomed there, um, what kinds of bodies uh, are, are acknowledged as having, has, having knowledge and as having experience and as having values. As Marie mentioned in, in, in the paper that they pre Cindy and her presented yesterday, often we still think of the, uh, a dancer as being a, a thin white woman who is standing and is probably heterosexual and probably comes from a middle class background. Um, and we like to challenge that idea and make space for all kinds of voices um, in, in dance. So um, in, in our work, the range of bodies that you see uh, is larger than what most people would necessarily think of as dancers. We, we have many seated dancers and standing dancers and folks who perceive the world through various different ways. And we see that those differences in the room as being a creative strength. And uh, there is a lot for me as a typical trained dancer to learn from someone who experiences the world in a different way. Um, so the, the practice is about learning to, to move, um, learning to engage, learning to connect with difference so that I'm not always looking in a partnering situation at someone who looks very similar to me. So we work a lot with the idea of translation. How would I translate a movement that feels very natural in my body? How would uh, a partner of mine, if I'm in a duet, situation who um, experiences the world without hearing or without sight or without the use of uh, some of their limbs, how would they translate that movement into their body in a very meaningful way? Um, so no one is a, no movement is more valued than the other. Um, the other thing that, it, that becomes a, a really um, very practical way that we invite inclusion into our work is around how we use language. Um, we, we try as best we can to use accessible language. Um, and accessible language uh, means 
language that doesn't alienate people. So of course, there's all kinds of dance terminology that I could use. Uh, first of all, the amount that I'm speaking right now probably alienates lots of people, as we can only take in so many words. Um, but very practical things about if I'm inviting people you know, in a warm-up situation to move around the space, is it really important for me to say the word walk around the space when I know that there are people in the room who that is not the way that they will travel? Um, so we say travel instead of walking. Um, if I'm asking people to do a warm up, is it important that I say lift your arms into the space if I'm trying to get them to feel expansion? Probably not, I could just say expand. And then I would learn from someone else's experience or interpretation of that word uh, all the different ways there are to expand. Um, so we, we, we're constantly refining the way that we use words to see how they could include or they might exclude people. Um, and as a, as a choreographer and a, as an artist, this is, there's a whole range of, of vocabulary of ways to move, of ways to, to make art that I have not ever considered because I spent most of my dancing life in a room of, with people who looked like me and experienced the world like me. So I have been very privileged to work with people who experience things differently and provide w way better solutions than I could ever come up with. Um, so I will conclude and I see the flashing light, thank you. Um, just, it, it's up there. You have to lift, lift your eyes to the heavens. Um, to, to say that um, our work is not really working with a specific community. Um, we don't go and try and find a group of people with disabilities and make a community out of them. Um, our, our work, I think, is aimed with taking a bunch of at taking a group of people or hopefully inviting a group of people who never would consider themselves a community who would never be in the room together original, uh, in, in another situation, who may not see commonalities amongst each other, but by moving together, creating dance together, we become a community and we expand the possibilities of when I pass someone in the street, I might see a commonality that I may not have ever otherwise um, thought of or considered. So. Alvin Tolentino is a choreographer, a dancer, a teacher, a designer, and a visual artist. Born in the Philippines, he moved to, to Canada sorry, in 1983, and in 2000, he founded company Erasca. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm still waking up. Um, it's been a really long week for me because of the new production that I'm in. Um, I've decided at 5 o'clock this morning that I will change what I have to share with you, believe it or not. <laughs> I was compelled with the two questions. How is dance inclusive and who gets to dance? Um, and I'm going to be a messenger today. In fact, I'm going to bring in two people that I've had a conversation about this. So we're extending it far and beyond. So if I can take you further, like someplace else, I, I plan to do that. That's my, that's my, I was compelled to do that today. Um, I was in conversation with two artists uh, in Asia, Southeast Asia particularly, with Canadian Peter Chin, who is presently in Cambodia, who has done extensive work in the community there, trying to really work on the notion of dance and uh, reviving culture uh, from the history of genocides of the um, Khmer Rouge. And my good friend, uh, Dennis Gupa from the Philippines, who um, has been a collaborator for me for many years right now, uh, dealing with the notion of community engagement and where does dance belong. Um, I wanted to share with you this, e this email that came to me uh, just last night from Peter Chin from Cambodia. In my experience in Southeast Asia, one of the most vivid and famous examples of dance inclusivity comes from Bali, where for over a century, the island has affected artists and anthropologists there because of its rich culture and music and dance that has been so integrated into every aspect of life that Balinese culture was celebrated for having no word for art, since art and creativity was understood as being an in, inalienable, in, 
alienable from living. There was no distinction then of art and life. So you had and still have farmers and mechanics and the lady down the street dancing in ceremonies and rituals alongside, in many instances, with trained dancers or temple dancers. In Cambodia, where I am now, it's not quite like that. For one reason being that the brutal Khmer Rouge was between 1975 and 1979, robbed the countries of 90% of the artists, including dance artists, and tore the cultural continuity of the countries severely so that in many ways, the country's artists are still recovering and catching up and having to re-understand the place and that dance had in their lives. What strikes me deeply is that after the war, according to an essay I read by the Indian writer Armitab Ghosh, when there was a destruction and destitution all around as people started to come back to the cities from where they had been evacuated four years ago to be forced farm labor, Khmer dance, was never the, nevertheless at the forefront of many people's lives, even though the population was in collective trauma and impo impoverished, the dance artists that were left found each other, both fully of joy that each of them made it through, and at the same time in deep grief for their, for their lost colleagues. They set about to make a dance a performance of their classical Cambodian dance, the first since the war had ended, with bits of costume and mask that could be found and salvaged. Uh, and musical instrument not destroyed by the fanatical Maoist Khmer Rouge. They collectively tried to remember their songs and dances and, per and presented it to the people amidst all the devastation and destitution. The hall was packed with dodgy electricity. There were hardly any lights and certainly no air conditioning or fans. When the, when the first uh, notes of the music was struck and the dancers came out throughout the whole hall. Every soul began to weep uncontrollably. Grandmothers, children, police, market people, everyone, every kind of person. The weeping continued throughout whole, the whole performance. This story has always moved me because it was obvious that the art of dance was for everyone and that in fact the very identity of the Khmer people was somehow encoded in those dance and music. It was as important as the necessity of life to them. It held secrets about who and what they are in ways that could be expressed or manifested in any other way. Today, that reverence and respect without being heavily orthodox continues to resonate in the young people who are dance artists that I meet. Dance is for anyone and everyone potentially. Classicism and refinement in the arts does not seem to exclude or look down upon non-artists in ways that I have experienced in the West. When I first arrived in Cambodia in 2003, the milieu was so accessible that within my first week, among other important people, I had met the Princess Bupa Debi, who was a famous Apsara dancer who had danced for the likes of Charles de Gaulle in the 60s and who also was the Minister of Culture. The openness of the dance scene here in Cambodia, I think, is an indication that culturally, dance seems to be for anyone and everyone. That's from Peter Chin, which just arrived last night. This is a conversation with Dennis Gupa that I had. How is dance inclusive? I asked him. Dance is an art form. Thus, it is part of cultural lives of people. In traditional communities in Asia, countries, they look at dance as embodied practice and lived experience. In Palawan, which is a region in the Philippines, for example, the Pagdiwata of the Tapunawa is a ritual dance that connects to the relationship of human, ecology, and spirit world. It is performed when the community is about to begin a farming season. The Babaylan of the shaman of the community would dance among the community members as vicar to the spirits to give them permission for agricultural activity. Indonesia has 3,000 type of dances. It is part of their daily lives. Everything is connected to dance and its art forms. The flowers being offered to the gods, temples and houses, altars are flower used for ritual dance. The dance is where the meanings of culture, the history is inscribed and kinship is emerged. Dance can only be inclusive when it is embodied and realized in everyday life formation, meaning, and making. So I reached out to those two people because I wanted to get a testament in terms of 
what has really profoundly changed my ways of making dance, researching it, disseminating it, uh, collaborating with other people, um, discourse, uh, talking about conversation like this in terms of how is dance included, inclusive and who gets to dance. In the last 10 years, my travels to Asia has been really profound, and I have tried to really embed that into my practice now here in the West. Um, and these are the artists that have really greatly influenced me, among others. And it's constantly shifting and allowing me to think about where should dance ex exist and how should dance be. And these are just some of the images that that happens in Asia. This is a festival uh, in the Philippines where dance is really integrated as part of, of a living entity, where they celebrate uh, the events as part of uh, a yearly annual event that, that captures the, the, the relationship of people between land and the cosmic. Uh, this is in Bali. They're about to enter uh, rituals in the temples. Uh, so these flowers are made daily, and they dance with it in the temples, and women and men carry them, and they sing, and they dance. And so now in the West, I try to integrate dance wherever I can into the public space. Uh, this is uh, a site-specific work that I've done many years ago. We were right in front of, I guess this is uh, in Stanley, oh no somewhere along the water <laughs> in Vancouver. <laughs> uh, this is a, a performance that I did as part of the 25th anniversary of Dancing on the Edge Festival. I performed for the entire festival, 20 minutes every day, and you can see the public and, and the rigor of being in the public and what it's like to dance to oblivious <laughs> uh, pedestrians. Uh, This is a performance that I did right here in the Roundhouse, just outside, uh, 2009, uh, where I get to see the entire landscape of the Roundhouse, uh, Yale Town, uh, with my crazy sound musician that was blaring at nine o'clock at night, but they all came out to see it. Oh, there's my music, and et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. Thank I'd like to thank you all for a, such an amazing and inspiring reflections. Um, I'm sad to have to tell you that uh, Lucas Silvestrini uh, has to get on a plane in about four hours. We're gonna, he's going to go back to work on Monday morning in London, England, and he's going to go, yeah, I spent the weekend in Canada. So before he will have a chance to even realize his jet lag, he's going to have a whole new set of jet lag. But because he has to sneak out, we actually asked him if he would be the first responder to the panel. And I know you've got to go jump on the sky train. So I really just want to take a breath. And, and Luca, if you want to share any of the thoughts that you've had about this discussion. Um, have we, got, we do have a Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say I, I practiced this morning to say my knowledge that we are standing on an unceded traditional territory. And then I forgot to say, so it was my little practice and then I forgot, sorry. Um, I'm not used to, but I wanted to, yes. Um, well, what can I say? I, you know, thank you so much for such a rich uh, presentation for all of you. It's so inspiring to hear um, artists talking about what they mean with inc inclusivity and um, and in, in one ma you know what amazed me uh, and that's what made my journey so worth it is to see how many uh, wonderful projects there are and uh, seeing people connected to whether it's traditions or local communities or uh, people dancing in any space, any kind of, uh, um, so it, it, it's wonderful. And, and there is an artistic um, 
in, uh, uh, motivation behind it. Um, and I think there is so much that c we can change. Um, it's a very an activist uh, way of uh, interpreting dance, you know. Um, we're not making changes just on the people that are taking part, but also on the way we receive this. Um, that's why I was sort of shouting the other night about Kamali, um, about, you know, it's important that this sort of work um, has a visibility because we, we can promote change uh, through it. Um, and, um, you know, last night actually we started during dinner to talk about what makes, what is community dance in a way. It's a very, it's a very difficult um, thing to answer. And, and as I was sitting here listening to all, the, all of you, it opened up my mind about what other ways of uh, uh, thinking or how rich community dance can be or community engaged dance. Um, and um, so I, I don't think I have an answer. But the, the other night I was talking to, sorry, Jill, Jill um, about um, yeah, what makes it or what doesn't make it. Of course, it's not, it's not important, but um, because the important thing is to, is to um, disseminate the, the power of dance and allow people to take part into these experiences. <coughs> and, um, but I, I think community dance for me has to have somehow, uh, and that's a provocation I want to throw there, for people to pick up, to, to disagree, and um, to fight. <laughs> um, but it, as a discussion, some kind of a social impact um, or social relevance. Um, and so it, even if it's artistic-led, but has to make somehow a change or promote change or starting to create, whether it's about breaking boundaries or uh, knocking down walls or, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that's what maybe it is about. Um, I'm sure it's more than that, but somehow it, that, that, that's stop us to think that it's just about training people to dance somehow. That's something else which I wouldn't call it community dance, somehow. Or doing a flash mob. That's certainly, it's wonderful. And it's, it's about bringing people to dance, to stay together, to share something through dance. And that's brilliant. But um, I don't know. I think it has to have a, some kind of message and meaning and, and promoting something. I don't know. It's a provocation, so. It's there for people to pick up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you. Um, so I'm, trying, I'm scared we're going to make the sound system go woo if the two mics are too close together. Thank you, Luca. And I know that at, at some point you're going to have to sneak out. So safe journey. And uh, we've so enjoyed having you here. And thank you for that first response. Um, listening to all of you, I, I had to write really fast because so much richness was coming from, uh, from what we all heard. Um, probably for me, the overarching um, things that emerged are, are uh, what dance can be for people. We talked about healing and so many of you about place and the importance of place in so many different ways, uh, whether it's embodiment or belonging or challenging where performances happen or um, political aspects of understanding um, where you are and where you have been for, for centuries. Um, and also this idea that dance is a doorway to integration whether you're talking about a practice that integrated into life creates a kind of fearlessness, a kind of uh, communication, uh, or whether you're talking about an understanding of how there is no separation from dance and understanding who you are and who you have been and, and who you will be. Um, and related to that very much is this sense of belonging. 
uh, cultural belonging, community belonging, belonging to a company, belonging to a family, belonging to a history. Um, but I was also very taken with all of you and with Luca's response as well around your fearlessness in uh, pushing around productive problems. Uh, continuity and change, um, absolute inclusivity and what entails, uh, time, <laughs> access, whether it's uh, quite practically about space or um, larger, more, more philosophical and conceptual issues that it seems to me that in particular community engaged practice uh, sees problems as productive and does not hide from them, but uses them as intersection points uh, for conversation and creation. Um, yeah, and I think maybe I'll just leave it there and uh, open it up to the audience for, for questions. And uh, maybe we can get a discussion going here. Uh, this question is directed to Margaret, but Karen, please feel free to augment, um, and other members too. First of all, Margaret, let me say thank you to the Gitsan because they, back in Expo 86, a personal thank you, they began my education of the heart, and I'm very grateful to them for that education around Native, Native culture and Native issues. Um, I want to frame this question uh, with a reference to Guildenstern and Rosencrantz, I may have them mixed up, are, are dead, in which he talks about seeing a, a unicorn in the forest. And as he brings it to the masses, it becomes a, a horse with an arrow stuck in its head. You made passing reference to the idea that in ceremony, the dance existed for the Gitsan. And in taking it into public performance, there were issues and questions. And it's always puzzled me as a North American who doesn't have that cultural witness that the Balinese have or the, the Cambodians have or Native Americans have in North America, that there's no cultural base that we come from the sacred to the performance space with that understanding. What has been your experience in trying to bridge that? I think there's um, two ways of answering that. And there's something that, um, to make that step, something that takes place within a whole community and when you engage with significant change that is taking place very rapidly, there are many difficulties in that in itself. So that um, what choices some individuals may make may not be in line with the way um, others would like to see um, the practice carried forward. So. Uh, in that way, we all make ourselves very vulnerable um, to share openly what was guided under very specific cultural protocols and, and, and ways of practice um, going back for many generations in a very specific construct. I think answering your question in a personal way, um, why to me I speak about identity is because it's also um, how we carry that forward within ourselves. Um, to me, I think that while the practice is something that um, is about relationships within our families, within our lineages, within the greater community, um, we also find a place within ourselves to carry all of that so that we are never one individual. Um, we are dancing as all that we are. And so I think that to me it's been a process of being clear um, within that uh, space and also how to clear, clarify um, the ways in which I can 
then articulate and share that openly with others and yeah I'll do that thank you yeah. grab a mic Karen so if, that's if I may address your question since you invited me to, yeah, mine's to do so well, uh, I'm not sure that I can accept your uh, what position or that those of us who are recently arrived in this country are without a cultural ground through which to access the sacred through dance. I have experienced in my growing uh, conversations and dialogue and collaboration through, uh, with other cultures, primarily First Nations, and in work with community, uh, that through deep practice, we evoke ancestral memory. And that's been one of the themes running through some of the work at with the Carnegie Dance Troupe, this again, this ephemeral but enduring entity that has both stability and, and constant motion. Um, I'm going to read something uh, that, again, Sandy Cameron, the poet from the community, who's no longer with us, sadly, wrote when he was watching and following uh, the piece Stand Your Ground. As I watched the dancers and the musicians who accompanied them in dream time, in sacred space, that is in space that is saturated with being, I recalled the words by T.S. Eliot in the Four Quartets. At the still point of the turning world, where past and future are gathered, except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance, and there is only the dance. So that resonated deeply with me. Thank you. Hi there. Um, Luca, Thursday night you said um, that you, among many, many, many things, that dance is therapeutic, but you also said right away we're not therapists, that's not what we're trained to do. But we do recognize that there's therapeutic um, results, that there's a therapeutic um, happening through dance. And I think many of us understand that, that it's very therapeutic. Um, so I am very curious for everybody, for you and everyone else, if you've had discussions and interactions and, and dialogue with um, dance therapists, drama therapists, or other expressive therapists about where your work overlaps and where it differs. Because I think we all recognize it is very therapeutic, but the focus and the intention is different whether you're coming at it from the perspective of a dancer creating community dance or as a expressive therapist or dance therapist coming at it as a therapist. <laughs> Good um. Well, we one of the projects the, uh, that we're doing in hospital, in the children's hospital, the last one we did, we tried to work with, I said tried, our intention was to try with the physiotherapists to have a, like an exchange, us learning from their practice and them learning from our practices. But it was very difficult in the sense that uh, they were very nice people. But from their point of view, uh, a therapy, uh, the, the physical therapy, follows a program and then cannot be distracted by anything else. So dance was a distraction in a way because then they couldn't measure if the exercises they were doing it to recovery from a surgery were actually making an effect because we were interfering with 
other things, you know, movement-wise. And they were appreciating it, but that collaboration we wanted to establish was not possible because their, their um, uh, knowledge and their practice is based on, by day two, they need to reach, uh, I don't know, they need to be able to show a sign that they can't, st uh, um, that their spine can be upright, and then by day five, you see, you, did you see what I mean? So we were trying to just bring music, uh, playfulness in the sense of uh, recovery, and from uh, a long period of uh, you know uh, uh, injury and and uh, physical inability. Um, so that was a kind of clear message for me that and frustration because there were clearly signs of well-being in the child. Uh, and I would say even in terms of mobility, but it's not proved, it doesn't, it can't be proved. And that's what I think, it, I think it's better not to even, uh, for me, I, I don't know, enter into that world, you know, and, um, and and but the beneficial the fact that, that we're feeling better if we dance it can't cannot be denied you know um so sorry i don't know if i answer your question but maybe we can hear from um some of the other panelists before we continue to another question um i just wanted to jump in and say that uh uh what came out for me in, in your discussion, uh, Naomi's observation about, about the importance of language. Mm. You say well-being and healing. Mm. No, no one says therapy, no. right? No. If anyone else wants to jump into this. I'll, I'll speak to this because often that's um, people's first response when I talk about the work that we do at All Bodies Dance Project is, oh, that must be so good for them. Yeah. Which is fine. It's good for everybody, <laughs> and like we, we, none of us would would participate in dance if it didn't make us feel good. Um, I, I think one of the the, the main things a, a goal about a therapeutic process versus an artistic process is our, our our focus is on the art. Our focus is on the thing that we make. Uh, we're not interested in changing anybody. We're interested in people making something from exactly where they are and who they are. Um, and if people happen to get changed through that process, that's wonderful, but that is not our intent. And I think uh, working on the dance or the product or the performance or the thing as a way that we're all facing a common goal rather than all facing only ourselves. And of course, we, we confront ourselves in the creative process, um, but the focus being on the work as this larger entity um, beyond ourselves, so it's not too, uh, yeah, just stuck on our own relationships only to ourselves. Um, Um, so themes that run through uh, my work are around belonging and in relationship with landscape. And when we um, when we go into places of belonging, there's also not belonging and the in between places. And sometimes that can be very vulnerable. And um, a practice that sometimes uh, Julie and I have established is we believe in the capacity of individual and of choice. And sometimes we just say. Um, when you see something opening for you that isn't part of our art making and you don't want it in the room, you do have a choice as much as we have capacity and control of ourselves <laughs> to, to choose to put that aside for now um, or close that door gently. And we make sure that we know resources in our community to offer people. We talk about it openly. When something arises, we... Um, we become a collective or take someone aside as needed. But we're really clear that there are people who um, are trained in certain fields that can, can go into different places and there's some choices in following them. I also think there's amazing best practices. Um, we've heard about them, um, the Arts and Health Project um, through Karen's work in Carnegie and that we as a community can um, learn from each other about best practices. 
and help each other. I'm going to answer to Luca's provocation with what I just heard. Um, I First, sometimes I struggle with like community engaged. Do we really need that qualifier? Uh, rah, rah, rah. But uh, it's about art, right? So if we're, it's not about only like being political and having a social impact because then we have to define what is the social change that we're trying to achieve and what is the political da da da. I think if as long as uh, we're creating an opening for somebody to engage in artistic creation in dance. Um, and for a population that was underserved or you know overlooked, then we are community engaged dance practice. Um, through that, we do have some social impacts, you know, like in terms of anthropology, through the practices that I've done, uh, the, what we heard from Alvin, and there is the building of social capital, the building of what we call the social fabric, you know, the trust, uh, the engagement, the, the, the belonging, the identity. Those are the things that come like, even just from going to a class and knowing that the people around you, you can trust them uh, and feeling that you have a connection with them, you know, week after week. And it also responds to, you know, one of the questions from Miriam that she was saying, well, what happens after the project? I, I'm, uh, what is the change that happened? You know, is there, if it's sustaining, oh, if you're not running a program, then you're not community engaged dance, right? That it's maybe there is ephemeral change that happened for a moment, and that's also valid. Uh, some of us run programs, some run projects. So I think the, there is a spectrum of responses, but if we try to just like create it to therapy or political, social change, then we're narrowing it again, and we're going against this democratic interpretation of what is dance. Maybe, that's just what I'm thinking today. <laughs> Somebody else like to jump in? I have a question. Uh, is there a, it's probably written somewhere already, but is there a best practices website that we can go to? We're from out of town. And after everybody leaves, we'll forget some of what you said until we can remind ourselves about it. Did you ask what was what are the best practices? Is, is there a best practice a website? website? Is oh, there I some place we can go online to kind of keep up with what's happening? I think Julie has. Julie, to Julie very much has something to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, uh, I I, um, I was put into sh touch with the Community Dance Foundation in the UK. And I'm a member, general member, and they have uh, four really, really, really interesting handbooks. And um, they lay really important grand groundwork there uh, in best practices. They touch on, upon the subject of therapy, not therapy, um, inclusive dance as a Naomi's practice is intergenerational dance practice and one like there's a handbook just kind of more general that encompass um, and so those can be uh, ordered and and they're really really uh, it's now called people dancing but you can google um, also community dance foundation um, and uh, they're based in the UK um, so I've been I've been really um, inspired by this. I believe some information could be found in, in um, Australia as well, because they have a long-standing um, culture of this community engaged arts over there. And um, we're trying our best to compile documentation here in Canada as well. There's been some papers. I mean, I remember reading a paper where Karen's work was featured. Was it by, oh, I forget the name of the writer. Uh, Doug Durand? Doug Durand yeah. wrote this yeah. paper, right? He's um, here today. Doug Durand wrote oh, a, a, yes. a, a kind of an overview. Yeah. Um, I, I, yesterday, someone no. asked me if I had a definition of community. And I said that I felt like community was a very slippery term. Uh, communities come together. Uh, they, they can be uh, temporary and provisional. You can belong to many different ones. Um, 
looking for best practices that you can tick off, uh, that's really tricky. So uh, Julie has um, uh, unpacked a, one place to begin. In our paper, Leading from Beside, we list uh, probably a couple of hundred resources. If you speak to Terry and Savannah, who are sitting here in the front row, there are so many books and articles. And I, I, would, I think it's better to kind of think of it as a nest of intersecting ideas and uh, learnings and observations and theories and field work, as, as Karen said so accurately this morning. Uh, and just to return to that idea that um, I'm, I'm not a person with a dance background, and I have been struck so many times by the interest in criticality around their own practice that comes from community-engaged dance and other community-engaged arts, that kind of self-criticality, what do we mean, who do we, what is inclusivity, how are we changing, how do we accommodate continuity and change, these are productive troubles. So it's hard to say these are the answers, but there are these kind of big bowls of research, right? I'm sorry, Caroline, I think I cut you off. Were you going to... I was going to take advantage of this mic. Excellent. <laughs> and then Karen. Oh. I just wanted to add to the list of local resources. The Arts and Health Project website also has a number of resource guides which um, may answer some of the, or not answer, may answer some of the questions uh, being posed around best practices, but also swim around in the, in the pool of questions as, as well. Oh, I'm really just wanting to echo what Marie said about the slippery slope of defining best practice in community-engaged work. I, I think it's uh, unnecessarily, uh, well, what am I trying to say here? It seems to me more that it's an ongoing, changing conversation with many, many perspectives. And as I said once, there's many ways to skin the community engaged cat <laughs> and that it can't be reduced to rules and things that you must do that will not make it then community engaged because it's art back again we come right back again it's the making of art and drawing people into this process of art making heals drawing people into this process of our art making creates community uh, roots people to the ground, connects them to each other. But that's as far as I think I'd go in terms of definition and anything resembling rules. Though I think where that becomes a, a, an issue, the notion of rules, is in meeting and engaging vulnerable communities. And uh, yes, there are ways that are worrisome, but it, isn't that just part of the conversation and the emerging and the growing of, of this art form? Just the other resource, the Australian one. Um, the Government of Victoria, where Melbourne is the capital, has a very rich arts history and they've got a really good resource which is on the Creative Victoria website and it's called Making Art with Communities, a Work Guide. So that's another brilliant resource. I guess I have two points. One is uh, within that notion of the therapeutic or non-therapeutic, I went through a training program which was absolutely not therapeutic, which um, was all about getting it right, being um, in the right place at the right beat, at the, et cetera. And it was, um, it was a life-crushing experience, literally. Um, I swore I would never do, quote, professional dance ever again <laughs> after I graduated. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with the context of who is teaching, how they're teaching, how they're guiding, how they're leading, how inclusive the work is. And it's so wonderful to hear that you're all really striving for that kind of framework. And I hope that the study of technique is less oppressive than
than it was when I was studying. Um, and the other point I wanted to make was, I think it's so wonderful that each of the people who come from different cultural backgrounds are exploring their cultural background. And I wanted to point out that uh, very few people of English and French background know anything about their history, especially here in Canada. I think in possibly if you're a French person in France, you might know more. If you're a, an English person in England, I don't know, you might be able to address that. So I, I would like to put out the viewpoint of the interest in history and expressing our history is a valid um, pursuit. I hope so because I'm involved in it. And um, that the English culture and the French culture are also cultures in our multicultural fabric. And I'm thrilled that people are exploring the multicultural fabric. Okay, one more, all the way up at the top. I just got a quick question. Oh, no, you need the microphone or Brian won't be able to. Oh, I see, okay. Miriam, just a question. You said you had shared revenue with your with Polymer. Oh yes. Right. Can you explain what that is? Uh, so some residency programs uh, like are free, right? Uh, so like I, I believe Naomi says and. Uh, Roundhouse, I think, has been uh, yes. free. free so uh, people in our program pay to register, right? There is, a, it, it, we try to make it accessible still because it's a community center. Uh, so the, it's like a class, you know, in a community center. So you put your proposal, they accept it, and they take 35% uh, of the revenues. That's, okay. that's how it's held right now at Hillcrest. Yeah, just wow. another example of how many different kind of models there are and uh, finding your way through what works for you and the community and the place where you are at this time, right? I want to say thank you so much to our panelists. That was absolutely remarkable. Um, what an incredibly rich morning. And um, I look forward to dancing with all of you this afternoon. We're going to take a break.